webinar, the Business Graduate School application process during COVID-19. My name is Martina and I'm the moderator of this webinar on behalf of PrepAdvisor. Our speaker today is Dr. Don Martin, who is a former admission dean at Columbia University, Chicago Boot and Northwestern University. Today he will talk about how COVID-19 has affected the graduate school application process for fall 2020 and beyond. Please type your questions in the Q&A box during the entire webinar and our speaker today will take time to give you an answer. But first, let's check the sound now. Could you please write in the chat box which country are you joining us from? Okay. Thank you. Everything is set. So, Don, I think that we can start with the presentation now. Great. And thank you, Martina. I really appreciate the invitation from Prep Advisor to be part of this webinar series that you offer to students. It's a wonderful service. So thank you for inviting me to do this. And hello to all of those who are joining us today. I really appreciate your taking time to be here. And first and foremost, I trust that you and your loved ones, your families, your colleagues are staying in good health during these very, very difficult times. It is a privilege to be here with you. Uh, my whole career has been focused on the graduate enrollment and student services process. And I am just, it's been an amazing career. Uh, Martina, I'm so sorry to um, bother you here, but I don't seem to be able to advance my slides. I'm, I'm clicking on the arrow button, but it doesn't seem that they are advancing. So I don't know if you can help uh, me. Uh, yes, you can try to share your screen again. Share I my screen again? Well, yes, just stop sharing and try to share it again, I think. All it's... right, let's try that. There we go. And, and uh, let's see if we can bring this up now. Let me try. There we go. Thank you, Martina. Yeah, and welcome. Apologies, uh, to all of you, thanks for your patience. As I was saying, my career has been spent in the enrollment and student services space. I've been very, very fortunate. For 28 years, I worked full-time in admissions and financial aid primarily, and then later on I added student development or student services to my portfolio. But at each of the institutions I served, Columbia, University of Chicago, the, the Booth School of Business, and Northwestern, uh, and Wheaton. I was Dean of Admissions and Dean of Financial Aid. And it was a phenomenal experience. So much so that I decided to write a book about it. And I wrote my book in 2008 called Roadmap for Graduate Study, a Guide for Prospective Students to provide students with a more general approach and some information on navigating the entire process from first thinking about graduate study all the way through to completing their graduate education. My two graduate degrees were two of the best experiences of my life, honestly. Now, I don't want to do a third one, but I sure enjoyed my master's program and my PhD program, and I applaud you for thinking. I assume most of you are here today because you're considering an MBA, and some of you may be thinking about that a little sooner than later under the circumstances with COVID-19. So let's move along. Oops, my slides are not... Let me see what's happening here. It seems like um, I can't advance the slides, so I will try sharing again and see if I can do this. I am very sorry for this delay. There we go. Today's agenda, I want to discuss very briefly what Grad School Roadmap is, then something I talk about in every webinar or presentation I ever give, what is the biggest mistake perspective or MBA graduate students make. Then we're going to talk mostly about the business school application process during COVID-19. Some things that I want to share related to this fall, fall of 2020, fall of 2021, and then some general information beyond. I will take 30 seconds to tell you a little more about my book. Then, as Martina said, we're going to answer questions. And for me, this is the most important part of my entire presentation. I love 
questions. I've tailored my comments to only be about 40 minutes long so that you have time to answer or, or ask questions and let me try to answer them. Uh, as I'm going through the presentation, please enter your questions as you have them, and we'll take time to answer as many as we possibly can. Then I'll close by telling you about my next webinar with Prep Advisor, which is coming up in June and July. Okay, what is Grad School Roadmap? Well, we are a small organization designed to provide resources basically for prospective graduate students and, and alumni. That's really what we're about. Maybe one of the things that distinguishes us a little bit is that our team consists all of former deans or directors of graduate admissions. In other words, we've been on that side of the table. We've actually done that work, in my case, over the 28 years that I, that I was a dean of admissions, I personally evaluated over 125,000 applications 80,000 of those were while I was at Chicago Booth as Dean of Admissions for the full-time MBA program. So this, this is something we've done. We've done it for a long time, and we believe we can bring that perspective to the table as we work with prospective graduate students. Now, speaking of that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, what is the biggest mistake prospective graduate students make? If I were to ask you this question right now, what might you tell me? Would it be that perhaps you send the wrong essay to the wrong, the wrong school, uh, that you don't have good recommenders, that you don't follow directions, that you miss something entirely in the application and don't address it? By the way, all of those are common mistakes that prospective students make, but it is not the number one mistake, in my opinion, over the 40 years now, 28 years full-time admissions work, 12 years with graduate school roadmap, over that space of time, there's one mistake that continues to happen over and over and over again. And it is this. Whoop. Okay, we're gonna need to stop and... Um, restart here, hold on just a minute. I am so sorry, I'm not understanding what's happening, but at least we can get back on. So I thank you for your patience. The biggest mistake prospective graduate students make every year without fail is not doing adequate research before they apply. This is, this is something I've seen every single year. Uh, when I worked at Chicago Booth, for instance, students would come to me uh, I, I held open office hours for them to come and meet with me to talk about whatever. They didn't have to make an appointment. They could just come in. As you might expect, most graduate students do not come to talk about something that's working well. They would come to talk about something that was not working well, a problem they were having, a concern. And several of them every year would say to me, Dr. Don, I don't like it here at Chicago Booth. This is absolutely not at all what I wanted, and I feel like I've wasted my time, and this is not the program for me. And, and clearly, to make a long story short, many times, nine times out of 10, those individuals had not done their research. They hadn't, they hadn't done their homework. And so I, I please, uh, I hope you will take this into account as you think about the business schools that you might want to apply to, be it this year, next year, or beyond. I hope you will have taken some time to truly determine if those schools are a match for you, not for your friends, not for your parents, not for a ranking, but for you. This is your education. It's your time. It's your financial resources. It's, it's all of that for you. So I hope you will take the time to do adequate research in my opinion, before deciding where you're going to apply, you should start out with a lot of options. And um, Martina, I, I'm not sure what's happening here. I don't know if you could step in and start advancing these slides for me. I don't understand why I'm having to reshare my screen at every turn. If there's a way you can step in to help me with this, I'd greatly appreciate it uh, because I'm, I'm just not able to advance these slides. Uh, let's take a pause here for a moment and see if we can get this straightened out folks my apologies again i i can recommend you to leave your presentation like this just to full screen uh with share your screen and 
All right, let me share my screen. I'm sharing it right now. And there, it's full screen. Are, are you gonna advance the slides for me? When you are at this mode, can you change the slides? No, I cannot. Okay, and when you bring it back to a previous stage, like... Um, no, they are, they are not advancing. Uh, hold on a minute. Oh, no, wait, no, wait. All right, let's try this. Okay. Um, okay, I, I hope, I, I really apologize to our students. I know this is frustrating uh, as it, it is for me. I'm sure it's doubly for you. So my apologies. Let's see if we can try to get this to work going forward. Okay, how, to, how do you avoid the mistake of not doing enough research? Well, number one, spread the net wide. Have at least 15 or 20 options that you're looking at before you narrow that down. To help you do that, I suggest creating a spreadsheet. And in my opinion, you should put your options in alphabetical order. You, you, don't want to, you don't want to start out yet with a rank order because you're just getting to know these schools and hopefully you're going to get to know more about them before you apply. My suggestion, create an alphabetical list of your options. And then on the other part of that spreadsheet, you want to list the areas that you would like to compare. For instance, is the location of the school important to you? Is the size of the student body important? Do you want a large student body, a small student body? How about professor contact? Do you know how much contact you're going to be able to have with professors if you study there? What about the opportunity to interact with fellow students? What opportunities do they give you? What about financial aid? Have you, here's two very important areas that you wanna be sure you have on that spreadsheet. First, have you spoken with current students or recent graduates about the program? This is critical. Now, I don't mean to suggest that you need to speak with, you know, 15 or 20 students at each business school. But in my opinion, it helps to at least speak with two, one or two students or very recent graduates. And you want to ask them two questions. First, what do you or did you like most? and least about this program. And if they're being honest with you, they will be able to give you both answers, what they like most and what they like least. There's no perfect business school. What you want is their honest assessment of their experience. They're, they're there now or they just graduated. The second question, very important. If you had it to do over again, knowing what you know now about this business school, would you go again? Would you still attend? This is critical. It, it, when my, my coaching clients have done this, they've often changed their mind about some of their options. So create that spreadsheet and, and put on all the areas. And then number three here, genuinely do some comparison shopping. You're about to spend a lot of time and quite a bit of your financial resources to pursue what will probably be a once in a lifetime graduate school or business school experience. And I encourage you to put the time in to really, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you one more question here on this and then we'll move to the next slide. <laughs> There's a business school in the United States. Now, I don't believe I've ever seen that this school was ranked in the top 10. I don't think I've ever seen that happen. But they're in the top 20, that's for sure. And you know, they have a program called the Executives in Residence program, okay? You know what this program does? It pairs a, an, a current MBA student with a former CEO of a Fortune 500 company, a recently retired Fortune 500 CEO. Pairs them together for the entire time of their MBA experience. I've never heard of any school doing this. I think it's, un, it's phenomenal. Do you want to know what the name of that business school is? <laughs> That's, this is kind of a trick question. I, I have three words for you. Do your research. <laughs> okay? It's out there. That's why I say, if you don't know these things, I think you're limiting yourself 
in terms of where you're going to apply. So please remember, perception about business schools is not where you start out. It's not, it's where you end up after you've done all of your research. Okay, enough said about the biggest mistake. Now we're going to talk about the, the business school, the grad school application process during COVID-19. First of all, I want to talk about implications for this fall, for this fall starting August, September. Obviously, as you may have already heard, there are major concerns about enrollments and financial aid. That's because of many factors. One, some admitted students are not now going to be able to financially afford to start this year. Because of COVID, they've had to make some changes. They may have been laid off. They, they don't have the financial means that they thought they were going to. And so they have either withdrawn entirely and will reapply down the road, or they've asked to defer for a year, maybe to start in the fall of 2021. So there's issues around enrollments, around finances, just what is going to be available to students uh, from what they thought would be available a few months back. Related to that, and because of that, many, many graduate schools and many business schools are extending their application deadlines well into next month and even into July. I've seen a few, but not very many, into early August. So this year is a very interesting year in that regard. The, the application deadlines are definitely being pushed back. In addition to that, many institutions and admissions offices are modifying their application requirements, in particular, re as relates to the GRE or the GMAT. Some schools are no longer requiring that you submit a score. Others, I've heard of a few business schools that actually are saying that you don't need to submit the scores when you first apply, but you will need to submit a score after you get admitted and before you start this fall. So there's, there's various ways this is being done. GRE and GMAT are offering many more options for taking the test. And in order to get more information about up-to-date uh, admissions requirements, deadline extensions, and all of this, for MBA information, I'd like to suggest two options. There's a, there's an, uh, a website called businessbecause.com where right on their homepage, they have a section of updated information on 2020 MBA deadlines. Similarly, a site called Poets and Quants has something similar. Uh, live updates, the COVID impact on business schools. So you, you've got those two resources. For graduate schools, other than business schools, if that's of interest, you can check out gradschools.com. There are over 70,000 graduate schools featured on this website, and they are all accredited, by the way, and they will also provide information to you on what they're doing with their applications. So some tremendous resources available you, to you. And if you're wondering, you know, Dr. Don, is, can I really apply for the fall still if I want to? Well, that's a, my answer is a calculated yes. There's some other things that have to be in place for you to do that. But if you're wondering if there are opportunities to submit applications yet for this fall, that answer is absolutely yes. So as I said, there are additional test location options. The GRE is offering that you can take the test at home if you would like. So you can check with them about that. There's, there's all kinds of, of various changes that are being made for this fall. It's a very unprecedented and unusual situation. Before my next slide, I'm gonna grab a quick uh, sip of water here. Okay. Now, let's say you were to apply this year and you were to be admitted, would you be able to connect with your fellow admitted students before you actually start the term? The answer is yes, absolutely. They're doing many kinds of online admitted student events, virtual events, remote events, where you will be able to still interact. Now, obviously it wouldn't be in person, but it would certainly at least give you an opportunity to still have a chance to connect with those who might become your classmates and part of your alumni network eventually. Next, there are two questions that are being asked and we still don't have all of the answers to these questions at this point. First of all, as we go along almost day to day, 
various institutions are making decisions on whether or not they're going to have their classes resume on campus for the fall or whether they will be held remotely or a combination thereof. That is something that is still in process. So once again, if you're taking a look at application deadline extensions for some of the institutions you're thinking about, you might also want to dig a little further. I would think it would be very close to their homepage on their websites, telling you what their fall class schedule is going to look like. So if you uh, want to check that out, that will give you a chance to know a little bit more about whether or not, uh, or how the classes will be undertaken for this coming term. Then the other question that's a bit in flux is how the internship for business school students, especially how the internship and rec the internship recruiting process is going to work. Uh, will they again be able to come to campus for interviews or will there be a decision to do something more remotely? That again is something, for instance, if you wanted to ask the admissions office, you could ask them this question now if this would, would impact your decision on where you might apply or if admitted, whether or not you want to start. Uh, you could ask the admissions or the career services office if they could help you understand what the internship recruiting process will look like uh, for internships that take place in the summer of 2021. Okay, now those are the implications I wanted to suggest for this coming fall. Bottom line, there still are opportunities to apply for this year. Okay, what are the implications for next year? If you are now compiling your information, you're doing your research, you're getting ready to possibly apply for the fall of 2021, what will that look like? Well, first of all, I and several of my, my colleagues who've been studying and following this believe that there will most likely be a substantial increase in applications for next year. Because some folks have not even, have they just decided I'm not, I'm not applying this year. I just don't want to uh, have to worry about this year. So I'm going to wait and apply for the fall of 2021. And we are tending to believe that there will be a rather large increase in applications. Coupled with that, as I mentioned earlier, some students who were admitted to start this year and felt that they couldn't for whatever reason have deferred and they will be automatically starting next year without having to reapply. So it may be that we're looking at some seats already taken next year from students who deferred plus an additional number of students who waited until next year to apply. All of this to say that for certain business schools, maybe not all, but for certain the competition will probably be a lot stiffer for fall of 2021 than it has been for fall of 2020 due to, to this situation. Thirdly, there will be continued concerns about international students. As we know, some students from certain countries, and this still has not been finally determined yet, but there are some countries where students may not be allowed to come into the United States, or maybe some other countries are not going to allow international students into their country to start studying this fall. They may tell them they're gonna to have to wait till January. And, and so again, this may cause issues with visas. And so we don't know for sure how this is going to play out. We know that international students currently make up about 13% of graduate enrollments in the United States. It's a very substantial percentage. So if there are issues around their being able to attend, that may open up a few more spaces in this year or two that's ahead of us for U.S. students or domestic students in their home countries. So that's something we're going to be watching. Next, obviously, continued concerns about finances and financial aid. Some institutions are being hard hit by COVID-19, and I've heard that in some cases, not all, but in some cases they've had to pare down the number of scholarships they're going to be able to offer. I don't believe loans should be affected very much, but, but certainly it could be that for some, the amount of scholarship money they'll be able to offer could be a little bit less. This is something it, you may want to put that, if you're thinking of fall of 2021, on your spreadsheet. 
one of the areas you may want to consider is what will financial aid look like? I would think that would be an excellent column to have on your spreadsheet. Now, a couple of questions here. Will programs have changed very much? I'm here again, we're a little bit early here, but whenever there's a major shift in the normalcy of our lives and the way we do things, whenever, and that includes a shift in the way educational programs are offered, whenever that happens, usually things don't quite return to exactly the way they were before. Now, this could be a very positive thing. What might be discovered is that because of having to reorganize rearrange, do things in a different way, some of those new activities might be so well received and they might work so well that they might be instituted for good. So yes, there could be a few program changes. Maybe there will be some courses that will only be offered online from now on. I'm not suggesting that any program will stop their online or their, their on-campus program. That's not going to happen. But some of the program delivery could actually change. And my feeling is that could be for good, not for negative. Secondly, what will happen with standardized tests? Well, as you may have already been discovering, if you've been checking on this, there is a growing movement in the United States, certainly, to lessen the emphasis on test scores, standardized test scores, in the application process. Several graduate programs are now dropping them. They're not having them as part of the application. Uh, several PhD programs recently at very, very major, very well-recognized universities completely eliminated their test score requirements. So this is starting to happen, and it could be that we'll see a little more of this, that there could be uh, some, some changing in the way that these standardized tests are offered. And lastly, do, will institutions, will business schools, will anybody have to close? Well, sadly, the answer to that question is yes, and that's already started happening. Some institutions have been so hard hit by this crisis that they just did not have the financial means to continue. Two quotes very quickly, this one from Poets and Quants back on April 1st. They did a survey of business school deans at quite a large number of universities. 46 of these individuals responded, and here's what they said, that they do believe that some business schools in particular are definitely going to be affected long-term and have to close because of, of this, of this uh, crisis. And for colleges and universities, for other graduate programs, uh, an uh, article in Market Watch on March 12th, similarly, there, there, are, there are concerns that some institutions are on shaky ground as the result of this. So there could be that between now and the end of this summer, some other institutions may be closing their doors. Um, I don't believe that in any given field of study, business, law, medicine, psychology, biology, communications, public relations, whatever the subject area, I don't believe the top 20 to 30 to 40 schools will be affected by this but larger, the schools that might be in the top 100 or beyond, this could affect some of those. So that may be something that will be changing a little bit here as we move into fall of 2021. Now I wanna cover my closing section here related to the implications. This is now for business school students in general for any year, fall of 2020, fall of 2021, fall of 2022, what are just some implications for you as a prospective student? Well, obviously, you want to regularly check the websites of the schools you're interested in. Absolutely. Keep, keep yourself apprised because right now things are very fluid and they're changing all the time and, and they're talking about a second wave of COVID-19. We don't know what that's going to look like in the fall or next winter. So this is going to perhaps be a bit of an ongoing situation where not everything will be set and maybe something may be told to you in the month of August and by October it will have had to have changed. So on a periodic basis, if you are thinking about starting in the fall of 2021 or beyond, you want to be checking websites on a fairly regular basis in order to uh, keep up with current information about what's happening. Secondly, 
Obviously, nobody really likes uncertainty. It's not one of our favorite uh, types of situations to be in, but I have a feeling that that's what we are definitely going to be encountering in this next year or two or maybe even three. There's just going to be a little bit of uncertainty about how things are going to play out. We're going to need to be patient. We're going to need to be flexible. And by the way, one of the ways, this is part of another webinar I'll be doing very soon for Prep Advisor on how to get noticed as an applicant. One of the best ways to stand out as a prospective student and then an applicant is your ability to handle something that changes over which you had no control and over which the institution necessarily didn't have control. But something changes. Some prospective students can't handle that. They freak out. They get all upset. They start yelling, I, I could write a book on the reactions of prospective students when something happened that was not under our control as the institution or under their control. But it, it was very sad to watch the way they behaved. And in light of that, obviously, they weren't admitted to some of the programs they applied. So be prepared for a little bit of uncertainty. Do we like it? No. Can we face it? Yes, I think we can. Thirdly, as I said, there is still time to apply for this fall. If you wish to do that, you may have to bunch a few things together, but it is doable. I'm currently working with about 15 students who decided they were gonna, instead of applying for fall of 2021, they made the decision to apply for fall of 2020 and they're doing a great job and they're meeting their deadlines. So it, it is doable. It will take a little bit more of your time than it might normally take, but it is absolutely possible. Okay, next point I want to make. Whether you apply for either this fall or next fall, and I probably should have said and beyond, one of the key factors you always want to remember is make sure to prepare the best application you possibly can. If you can at all avoid this, don't let yourself get into a position where you feel rushed. When you feel rushed, you tend to make more mistakes. And admissions committees, they don't know what's behind the scenes when they get your application. But if it's riddled with mistakes, then they're not going to be able to, they're gonna think, boy, this person didn't spend a lot of time on this. There's, this essay has all kinds of typos or, or grammatical errors or whatever. And it's gonna make, it's gonna look like you didn't really prepare. So make sure you always take the time to prepare the best applications you can. Okay, I actually finished my comments about five minutes early. I hope, I hope, I hope you're writing your questions down. We've got some time here. Martina eventually is gonna come back on here in a minute. She's going to, she's been kind enough to offer to ask the questions for me. So she's going to do that and I will answer as many questions as we have today. And then after the webinar, you're gonna have an opportunity if you wish to reach out to me if there's a question you'd prefer not asking in this format but you have another question you'd like to ask me privately, then you'll have my email information and I sure hope you'll reach out. A quick word about my book. This is the only comprehensive book on the graduate admissions research and application process out there. The, second, the first edition did so well that we ran out of books and we printed a second edition in 2018. It's only 105 pages long. It is not a volume. It's not I didn't write it so that it would be some extensive, comprehensive book. I didn't think anyone would want to buy something that large. But it is comprehensive yet and succinct. Four chapters. The first chapter, all about doing good research. How to, how to really do that. Second chapter, the entire application process. Anything you ever wanted to know about any part of that process. Thirdly, how to succeed once you're in graduate school. I know of no other book out there, anywhere, that talks about this. I have 15 tips in that book, in that chapter, on how you can make the most. As I told you earlier, my two graduate experiences truly were life-changing. They were phenomenal. And I would want that for you. I really would. So this chapter tells you how to make the most of that experience. And lastly, a top 10 questions list of, for four different groups. Inquirers, applicants, admitted students, current students. Those four groups what are the top 10 questions they've asked me over these 30 some years uh, before I wrote the book? And what are my responses to those questions? So if you're interested, you can go to the website, grad school, I'll, I'll, my website will come up here in a minute. Go to the book page. 
If you click on the order now button and you enter that special promo code, GSRM, which stands for Grad School Roadmap, all capital letters, I will be happy to give you a substantial discount on the purchase. So you can do that if you wish. Okay, some upcoming webinars. There's going to be a webinar coming up on the GRE and MBA applications take, taking place with Prep Advisor on May 18th. And there's going to be another webinar on the uh, online GMAT on May 29th. Uh, one of them already took place, obviously, but there's another one coming up soon on the GMAT. I believe these webinars are recorded, so if you're interested in that, you would definitely want to take advantage of both of those. And we're working on another webinar that I'm going to offer. We just haven't absolutely finalized the date yet. The MBA master's application process, the do's and don'ts. This is gonna be coming up sooner than later. This is a tremendous resource for you on some things you absolutely, I, I have uh, seven ways to be positively noticed as an applicant and seven deadly sins. These are things you absolutely do not wanna do even if not, in fact, most of these times that applicants make these mistakes, it's not intentional, it's not deliberate, but none, nonetheless they make them and it can cost them being admitted. So among other things, this, is, this webinar is going to focus on the do's and the don'ts of the MBA master's, uh, uh, master's application process. So I hope you'll join me, I hope you'll ask some of your other friends to join in, we'd love to have you. And now we've come to the end of the webinar it's just about 20 minutes before the hour. Martina, I wanna thank you again and Prep Advisor. You have been so kind to work with me, to have me uh, to present these webinars. For those of our attendees, I congratulate you on your decision to think about furthering your educational journey. I hope it's as rewarding for you as mine was for me. And if I can be of any help down the road, please feel free to contact me. My email address is here. Our website address is there. We offer free coaching consultations, third, free 30-minute consultations. If you're interested, you can fill out the contact form on the website. We'd be happy to chat with you further. But now is the time for questions. Martina, I hope we've gotten some. I'm going to turn the mic back over to you, and we will start going through and we'll answer as many questions as we possibly can. Hi again from Prep Advisor. Don, thank you so much for this informative presentation. You're welcome. And for sharing this important information with our participants. And now it's time for the questions. Okay. So let's start. Looks like we got some, that's good. Yes, so the first one is do you think we can benefit equally from online start of the year in comparison to the on-campus start? That's an excellent question. Initially, yes, I, don't, I, I believe you can benefit from online education. Obviously, the difference is perhaps not immediately having an opportunity to engage with someone after class or, or get together with a study group together in person. But there are, there are many opportunities to still do that, even if you're remote. I don't, I don't believe that uh, this is going to be that much of a of a huge difference especially because it's not going to be for the long term it's going to be in the shorter term now interestingly enough if you had asked me this question say 20 years ago when online programs were first being introduced i probably would have honestly said that i think you're you're probably better off to wait till you can start on campus but in light of the incredible development of online education over these past two decades, in my opinion, they, it, it, it is right up there within class instruction for the most part. I truly don't believe the only thing that might impact whether you would want to start online or not is your own personality. Do you, do you just feel like you would get more out of it yourself if you could be with your fellow group of students in the classroom with the professor right there. If you believe you can still get something in the remote, with the remote option, in terms of the quality of the education and what you're going to be offering, I honestly see no difference. That's an excellent question. Thank you so much for the answer. 
The next question sounds like this. How shall okay. I manage the visa situation? Shall I first check if I may have visa problem before I decide to apply? Or it's better to postpone my application for next year? Excellent question. My, my thought here is that yes, with visa issues, I would think you would want to check with your country's consulate or embassy or visa granting institution or office and simply ask them you if you're able to do this so you're thinking of applying for the fall of 2020 let's say uh, and let's say you don't get admitted until august would you be able to have a visa that would enable you to come to the united states now now keep in mind if the institution to which you would be attending is going to start off with their classes online and they admitted you, you would then conceivably be able to take those classes still where you are and perhaps come into the United States starting in January and then have time to get your visa. So you may have to do some checking here. I would suggest checking that out first to the best of your ability. And again, with any of these questions that I am answering if you have further questions on those that you asked that, that i didn't cover something please feel free to reach out to me again good question thank you so much for the answer another question is this could you give some direct points on how to nail the, vir the virtual interview how to nail a video interview sure I have a, I've got a couple of suggestions. I work with my students on this all the time. I, I love this option, by the way, because, you know, while it may be a little more nerve wracking for an applicant who knows that once the camera starts, they can't stop. They can't say, wait a minute, I want to start over. I know that's nerve wracking. But on my side of the table, as an admissions dean, having an opportunity to see you, to hear your voice, and to watch you communicate is so helpful because it, 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 it lifts you off of the page, so to speak. It gives you an opportunity to have your true voice heard. And it's a tremendous way, just as today, you're hearing me, but you're also seeing me. And that, that makes a difference, just in terms of my ability to interact with you and your ability to listen to what I'm saying. So here are my tips. If you're doing a video interview, first of all, Practice, practice, practice ahead of time. I would suggest, I know this sounds a little silly, stand in front of a mirror. Stand, be, be professional, be, have a, have a you know, wear, wear a nice, men, a nice shirt, women, a nice blouse, whatever you're gonna, but, but be professionally dressed, stand in front of the mirror, and if you know, have an idea of the question you're gonna be asked, some are actually told the question, others are not, but they're told a general idea of what the question might be about. So you can practice either way. If you absolutely know the question, practice it. If you don't know, but you, let's say they're gonna, they say we're gonna possibly ask you a question about something related to leadership, or we're gonna ask you a question about what are some of your most strongest points, or we're gonna ask you a question about why you wanna to come to our program. It, so if you have a sense of what you might be asked, practice. And, and if you're told you'll have 60 seconds for this, then time yourself or have someone use a, a stop clock and time you so that you can start getting a little more familiar. Now, you don't wanna to go to the other extreme, by the way, where you're so practiced and so scripted that it sounds like you memorized something. That's too much, that's too much the other way. You, you wanna be somewhat natural. You wanna be, you wanna be like you're con con conversing with the admissions committee, not reading a paper. You wanna, so you, there's, a, there's a fine line here. You practice, so you become more comfortable with the idea of doing this, but you don't become so that it looks like you're reading it off of a, of a, of a, pro of a teleprompter. Now, when you're actually doing this, Will you be nervous? Yes, that's absolutely fine. If you make a mistake while you're doing the video essay, just look what happened to me at the beginning of this webinar. There was a problem sharing the screen. So we worked it through, we kept moving forward and we went right on with the 
with the presentation. That's what you're going to need to do. If you make a mistake, you could say, uh, I'm sorry, I meant to say that, or I apologize, I, I was going to say this, and you keep right on going. Try to smile. Not every, you haven't seen me, you know, doing this through the whole webinar. That would be fake. But nor do you want to look very serious every minute either. Try to, especially at the beginning, smile a little bit. Just, just make it, try to smile. That, that eases the tension even for yourself. And lastly, please look at the camera. Don't, don't be looking over here, uh, down here so you're watching yourself. Right now, when I'm talking with you on this webinar, I'm not looking at my, myself on this. I, there's a, I can see that I'm here on the screen, but I'm not looking there. I'm looking at you. So when you do this, you need, when you are doing your video essay, you need to do that. You need to look at me. Good eye contact is very impressive. So now, if you have to look away for a second, that's fine, but you don't want to be talking as if the person you're talking to is over here or they're down here somehow uh, sitting below you, you wanna speak into the camera. So those are some immediate suggestions that come to mind for a video essay. These are excellent questions, Martina. Do we have any more? Yes, we have another question regarding deadlines and it sounds like this. Could you share your opinion about, about if some business schools will extend their deadlines for third or final round admissions even for 2021? I'm sorry, this question is, can I offer some thoughts on the fact that institutions are extending deadlines, perhaps even for um, fall of 2021? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, personally speaking, I think that's a very good move. Um, for one thing, for this year, as I said, with enrollments being uncertain and schools and graduate schools, business schools, not sure how many students are actually going to be able to show up. This, as I said, things are changing almost every day, almost every week. So th some students who thought they were going to be able to start even now may have a change within three weeks and that they can't. So that's why deadlines for this year are being extended. For next year, uh, again, depending on where we are for the fall of 2021, it may very well be that schools will still feel that they need to extend deadlines. I'm a little less sure if they will do that because as I said earlier, I think applications are going to go up for the fall of 2021. So I, I don't know if at this point I would necessarily suggest that they could, but they might. But the fact that they're extending them, that's a good sign. There, that's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that under these circumstances. Good question. Thanks a lot for the answer. And uh -huh. I guess this was the last question. Wonderful. Well, I, then we, this is I, good. We finished on time. Yes. I want to thank you a lot again for this informative presentation. You're most welcome. And please, everyone, review the upcoming webinars on our website, prepadvisor.com. And we are looking forward to meet you in the next upcoming events. But for now, I want to wish you good luck in your academic journey. Thanks, Don, again. And have a good day or good night to everyone. All the best, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye.